is an eight iron and it's a dead shank. Wow. Way right. Oh, Take that shank. Hop off the puzzle. Ah. You gotta be kidding me. Very tough pitch shot right here. You gotta hit it into the hill. One hop up and bite and it's in. Kind of like that. I would like to welcome three-time web.com winner and former first-team All-American Peter Tomasulo to the Sub-70 podcast. Peter, I really appreciate you taking the time today to do the show. I'm uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. First off, it was really nice to meet you at the Rust-Oleum Championship outside of Chicago at Ivanhoe uh, when you were in town for the web.com tour event and taking the time to talk to Jay and myself. Um, we watched a play with Spencer for about nine holes. Your, your, your game looked good. It looked solid. How's the current state of your game, in your opinion? What's kind of going on, and what are you sort of working on, if anything? Um, my game's been pretty good. Um, uh, I haven't been able to put uh, put my tournaments together very well. You know, I haven't uh, I haven't played as well as I like to this season. I'm driving it really well. My putting feels good. Um, if I had to pick anything, my iron play and wedges uh, need to improve. But I've been grinding on them uh, the last couple of weeks and ready to ready to get on the roll here. I saw where you're at on the money list, and I know there's still plenty of time to get into that top 25. Um, is there sort of a game plan for the second half that you're going to sort of put into place to kind of to get where you want to be, which I'm sure is back on the PGA Tour? Is there going to be more events, less travel events? Sort of what's the what's the game plan for the kind of final half here? Yeah, I, I mean, I set a schedule pretty much from the get go, and I try to stick to it whether I'm playing, you know, whether I've played poorly or well. Um, I think um, I've been around a little bit longer now, and I feel like I know when I'm going to be burnt out, or I know when I'm going to be excited to play. And um, you know, I think a lot of people think, you know, you're just out here playing golf. It sounds like a pretty cush thing to do, but you're traveling around a lot. You're playing every day. Um, you know, you're walking ten miles a day. Um, it is a long grind, and you don't want. And with the travel, you don't want to burn yourself out mentally, and uh, and partially physically too. But um, you know, I don't play more than three or four in a row. Um, four is kind of my max, and so I kind of set my schedule from the beginning of the year, and that's what I do. Um, and so I'll play the next three events, and then take a week off, and then play three more in a row. You were talking about parts of your game, like, and, and I agree with you. I saw that you were you were playing well. When it's not fully coming together, as you've been doing this for quite a while at this point, is patience become easier or is it harder to be patient knowing that you're that close and it's you're right there to try to, to play some really, really good golf? Does does that does the patience are you better with the patience as you've gotten to be more of an experienced touring professional, or is it still frustrating as ever when you know you're close but you're not quite there yet? How do you kind of deal with that? Oh, well, I think I think patience is something that well I battle for sure, and I think you know pretty much everybody at every level battles it in a different way. Uh, you know, everybody's got goals that they're trying to attain. Whether you're you know Jordan Spieth or Dustin Johnson, or whether you're in my shoes trying to get back on the PGA Tour, um, uh, there's a fine line between you know trusting what you're doing and um, knowing you're on the right track and saying and really looking at yourself and saying, look. I need to improve my iron play if I want to be a great player on the PGA Tour. And so you really have to pay attention and work on the things that you know need to work on and then try to maintain confidence in, in what you are doing well already. So um, the, the, as far as the patience aspect goes, I don't know if I'm getting better. I think I'm getting better in certain ways, but... Um, you know, I've got a family now. I've got, uh, I leave my family when I go on the road. Uh, I have a lot of different stresses, but, um, financially it's a lot more difficult being out here because I got a couple more mouths to feed. And so, uh, there's a lot more impatience in terms of getting back to the PGA tour in that aspect, uh, in terms of uh, my sense of career and what I'm doing. But, um, I feel like I'm growing as far as patience on the golf course. I'm not sure if, uh, I've verbalized that correctly, but on the course, I feel like I'm a much more patient player, but in terms of, I've got a huge sense of urgency to get back on the PGA tour in my career. No, I mean, that makes sense. And then, you know, like even at my amateur level, when you play really well, and I'm assuming it's the same for your level, 
when you're playing your best, it just sort of slows down. It just kind of comes to you, and you can't sort of force it. Have you noticed that when you've played your best golf, it just sort of felt like you didn't push hard. It just sort of, you saw each shot. It just kind of came to you, and that's sort of the spot you need to be where it's just all congruent. It's clear. You see it. And pushing doesn't necessarily make the score lower, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. And, and um, the, uh, another thing that, uh, you know, I was just talking to my buddy about, uh, I just drove up here. We drove from Springfield, Illinois, actually, and uh, with Max Homa. And we had, you know, we had an eight-hour road trip talking about golf for seven and a half of the hours. And uh, when you're playing well, this when even when you're playing well, bad stuff happens to you on the golf course. You hit one that goes in the trees, you, you know, you miss a short putt or whatever. That stuff just doesn't bother you as much when you're playing well because you've got this confidence that it's really not that big a deal because you've got a lot of holes left. When uh, you start having some impatience and pressing, you think you need to be perfect and everything, everything magnifies and everything um, seems like a bigger deal than it is. That's probably, I would say, in a lot of guys' shoes out here that are trying to get back to the PGA Tour if they've fallen back down to the web.com tour, I think that's probably the biggest challenge is, is you want to get back there so bad, you press so hard, and you're coming off some struggles if you got back down here that you need to, you need to build that confidence back. Are you a big stat guy at this point from when you started on your career? I know they have basically every stat you could ever come up with. Do you study those a lot and, and look at the statistics to see where you need to get better? Or do you just sort of know, hey, I need to work on this because I can just sort of tell I'm not on my fifth gear right now with it? Yeah, well, uh, they've got great stats on the PGA Tour. Um, the stats on the web.com tour, tour, uh, the web .com tour can be a little misleading. You know, it's, it's greens hit, putts per round. Um, you don't have strokes gained off the tee. You don't have strokes gained approach to green or strokes gained putting. So I think um, you can really pay attention to certain um, stats that do affect play. You know, those strike, strokes gained putting and strokes gained off the tee and stuff on the PGA Tour, but you don't have as quality statistics out here on the web.com tour. And so statistics can be misleading. So I think um, out here on the web.com tour, there's uh, you, you know what you need to improve on. I'm not making enough birdies, and I'm making too many mistakes, and it's mostly with my iron play. And I can I can narrow that down, and I can I can assess my own game pretty easily in that respect. Yeah. Of when you're firing on all eight cylinders versus not, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That you still you still have an inner sense of there's no surprises of where you're going to work on and what you're going to be trying to accomplish. Yeah, if I get when I get back on the PGA Tour, I'd like to, you know, I, I will assess my different um, statistics a little easier. You know, you got you got information out there where you go, okay, from 125 to 150 yards, I'm 130th in on tour, and from 150 to 175, I'm 18th on tour. It's pretty clear what you need to work on. Right. Um, but you don't have that kind of information out here. You were talking riding with Max, you know, for an eight-hour road trip. Who's some of the other guys on the Web.com tour that you're tight with, and they, just on a human level, you respect them as players, but you also really like hanging out with them. Um, there's a bunch of good guys uh, out here. Like this week, we're up in upstate New York, and we got uh, there's a resort here, but we also rented a house, so we've got uh, like a six-bedroom house. I'm here with uh, Kevin Stadler, who's on a, um, coming back off a of medical from the PGA tour, and he's doing some rehab starts. Uh, Spencer Levine, uh, Nick Flanagan, um, Andres Gonzalez. Oh my God, he's got to be a. That's a good group. How Andres yeah. Gonzalez and Spencer Levine in the same house? Like I would pay great <laughs> money just to just to sit there and just take that all in on an evening. Andres could storm in the door at any moment, and we could hear you, you might hear him Put in him the on. background. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's like a character and a half on, on his own. That I mean, that sounds like a fun frat house to hang out in for a few days. I would do that. Yeah, it's going to be a good group. We're going to play a lot of cards and grill out some food, and we've got a good setup here. So that's a lot of the guys. There, um, there's a bunch of others. I hang out with uh, Brock McKenzie a lot, and then uh, there's some young guys that I've gotten to know a little bit um, who I think are great players, and they're going to um, – there's Kramer Hickok. He played well last week. Um, there's a bunch of good guys. Uh, I'm, I'm 36 years old now, and, and I'm an older guy out here on the web.com tour, and there's – you know, I don't – travel around with as many of the um let's see how i can verbalize it. The, it when you come out here and you're young you got a big group of guys and you hang out a lot more um i've gotten a little older and i like my alone time I, i'm, a, I'm a, 
out here and uh sometimes i like my time alone at the hotel and stuff like that and just to put my feet up and relax but um a situation like this where we got six guys in the house this should be a pretty fun week yeah and um we really like we've been we're kind of like cultish fans of spencer levine on this podcast we want him on because uh, like he's such an interesting story from like a golf fan standpoint like I'm, you know trying to be objective but he's interesting right he's an interesting guy and like we watched him with you were playing with him yeah. i don't know what's going on he, he seemed calm he didn't he, he wasn't all fiery yelling at the golf ball and he wasn't chain smoking cigarettes i'm like what what happened to spencer levine he's he's, he's mellowed out into his 30s so i would so love to get him on is, some time to, yeah, to, to I'll, pick I'll his brain to I'll talk to him about it. He is, uh, he's one of my favorite guys I've ever been around. He's a, um, he's a fantastic guy. Um, I think there's a little bit of a misconception about like, I, I think there's certain people that s- think he's like an angry person because he's like, he's so animated on the golf course. He is a passionate guy and he's one of my favorite people I've ever played golf with. Um, he's funny. He's cool. He's, he's a very interesting guy. He actually doesn't smoke cigarettes anymore. He's quit smoking cigarettes. He's a, he, he's just, um, I can't say enough good things about him. And, and, and he gets a, he gets a, a reputation for his fiery temper, but he is just a passionate competitor. He wants to kick your butt out there. And I love it. I love playing against him. I love playing with him. And, um, yeah, it should be fun hanging out with him in the house this week. So, and I think you, because I've been around the golf business for a long time, so I know a lot of the tour reps and stuff, right? So, like, I think you're hitting it on the head. Like, people don't think he's a jerk. I think people like, because he's supposed to be like everything I've ever heard, and this is why I like him. He's supposed to be the greatest guy in the world, like, to hang with, right? Like, he's supposed to be like a super quality human being, but he's an interesting cat on the golf course, right? So, that's that's why people like him. I don't know anybody that knows him that does not like him. I don't. Exactly. I, I, I can. I can absolutely say that. I do not know one person that knows Spencer that doesn't like him. And I've had people go, "Whoa, who's that guy that was losing it on the golf course?" And I say, you know, he's a passionate competitor. There's not. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, you you want to harness that and not, you know, not let it loose all the time. But that's a. That's a. That's a He's just competing out there, and it, you get him. Uh, and I love him on the course. He could. He could lose it out there. And then you could walk up to the fairway, walk up the fairway with him, and he's as cool as can be. He's just into it. He's competitive, and he's into it. And uh, I, I just love the guy. Yeah, and I think that's why people like him because all of us have tried to like have lost our shit at this game, right? Because you just you've gone crazy. And most touring pros, they don't. But you know, every now and then he does. But he's supposed to be a great guy. So if he was like that and a jerk off the course, I don't think people would love him the way they like him. Like he has a cult following, right? But because yeah. he's like the coolest dude ever, but he he is animated. I think that's the line that people love because we've all been just so <laughs> you know ape shit crazy on the game that yeah, well, and he actually okay. will explode. But he's like a good yeah. dude. If he was a, not a good dude, I don't think people would dig him as much. That's the interesting part. My older brother is, uh, he's a year and a half older than me. He's my closest friend and he comes out and caddies once a year. And so he's gone to know Spencer and he always, and we've gone to dinners with him. And, um, and my brother always tells me Spencer's his favorite golfer. I'm number two. Um, and I, I tease Spencer about that. And, uh, he just, uh, he gets a kick out of him. He's just a great guy. Yeah. Well, enough about him. Let's hopefully we can get him on sometime. Cause I would love to have yeah. him on. <laughs> We'll just talk about how you started playing golf. How did you uh, kind of fall in love with the game, and where did you start playing okay. growing up in California, and um, how did you sort of get interested in it? Okay, so my dad was a, a member of a course called Virginia Country Club in Long Beach, um, and we lived close to the golf course. Um, and so I'd go out there with his dad, my dad after work, um, you know, play one, two, three, and nine. They kind of wrapped around. And uh, you know, after work, he'd take me out there and my brother, and we'd go play one, two, three, and nine, and we get we got hooked. Um, I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old. And then when I hit the summer when I was 12 or 13, I just got completely hooked, and I played every day I could. Um, I'd walk over to the golf course, I'd ride my bike over to the golf course, and I'd just play all day. And um, I had my brother and another good buddy, and we just spent, um, I played soccer uh, at that time too. So if I wasn't playing, if I didn't have a soccer game or soccer practice, I was at the course morning till dark. And, uh, you know, as most people know, you get hooked on golf and you become an absolute fanatic. So 
Uh, I love it. I've always loved it, and I've been hooked on it ever since. And then when you attended the University of California, um, huh? how was that experience? How did you pick that university and then obviously winning the uh, 2004 NCAA National Championship really had to be a highlight to your college career? Yeah, it was awesome. It was, it was, a, it was a great memory, a great time. Um, so I, I, when I was finishing up high school, like I said, I was playing a lot of soccer too. I wasn't a highly recruited player coming out of high school. Um, I played a tournament with a guy that was a junior on the Cal golf team. His name's Han Lee. He's playing in Japan right now, and he was a junior on the team, and I played the tournament with him, and he relayed to the coach that he thought I might be under the radar and be a good guy to check out, and I got a call from the coach that fall, the, the fall of my senior year, and he, um, it's probably the pretty easiest recruiting trip he ever, or call he ever made. I, I, he asked me if I was interested in Cal, and I said, but you're the only one that's called me. If you can get me in the school, I, I'll sign up right now. And he said, uh, you know, what's your GPA? What's your uh, SAT score? And I told him, and he said, we could get you in. And I said, <laughs> send the paperwork, I'm in. And so I signed up. I uh, had a very small scholarship to start uh, uh, college, and then I got a lot better as I went through college. I, I started, I think I was a honorable mention, all Pac-10 my first year, and then uh, first team all Pac-10 my second year. Uh, third team all American my junior year, and then first team all American my senior year. So I really got better every year. Um, and my senior year, we had a great team, a bunch of really good guys, and uh, we were able to beat UCLA and Kentucky uh, in the finals. Uh, and um, it's one of the, my favorite memories of my life. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you really got, I mean, the dream of kind of going pro became a reality with how good you got in college, obviously to be first team all American. That's a lot of progress in a four year period. And then, um, to accomplish that's amazing. Then to get to play in the Palmer cup. How cool was that experience to play against Europe had to be a huge honor as well. Yeah, that was after my junior year, uh, the Palmer cup, uh, we had at the U S versus Europe and it's in, uh, it was in Kiwa Island that year. It was my first time ever traveling to the South. Um, it was a really cool experience. I went, um, we had a really good team. We got beat, unfortunately. Uh, we had a really, really good team, though. Bill Haas, Brant Snedeker, uh, Ryan Moore, um, some other guys, and uh, Dustin Bray, who was a, who was a good player. And um, we we just had a great time. It was, it was one of the coolest experiences as well. Um, you know, putting the shirt on with the flag, USA bag, and um, doing that. It was a that was a very neat experience. And then in 2004, you turned pro. What uh, yeah. tours did you start playing right away once you once you turned pro? And was it Canadian tour out of the gate, or did you mini tour it for a while? What was that sort of progress as you started out? So I went to um, second stage. In, well, I got through first stage and went to. I missed it second stage in the fall of 2004. So um, I I didn't know what I was going to do. So I talked to. Um, I got a really good relationship with a tailor made rep in college. Uh, his name's Tim Hewitt. Um, and he told me that Canadian tour was the best way to go. You get four rounds of golf. You're competing with caddies, ropes, leaderboards. There's just, it's a, it feels a lot more like the tournaments that you're aspiring to at that point, rather than going to the, um, mini tours and carts with, um, without caddies. And so, um, I went up to Canada, uh, well, and, um, I played really well out there and the top three on the money list at that time would get into the, there were two web.com events in Canada and one PGA tour event in Canada. And so if you're in the top three on the money list, you got into those events. And, um, so I got into those and that's how I eventually got my web.com tour card. I got into one of those and I won the, uh, the, um, Calgary open and, uh, which was a web.com event and got my, uh, got my status out there. And then you won on the Canadian tour, before that or after that is what well, I'm assuming you won before Correct. that when you won the Montreal yeah. Open? I won the Montreal Open and that got me into the top three on the money list. And then from there, I was able to get into the um, web.com event and it was about a month later and I won that. And so then, um, you know, I went from having no status to having web.com status in August of that year. And um, that was a pretty, uh, pretty exciting time for me. Gosh, That's a, a long way. time ago. Yeah, it's a hell of a way face, to man. <laughs> start off your pro career, though, right? Because it's not that easy, even winning on the Canadian tour. I mean, to come off with two major tours with two wins, I mean, that's the that's a hell of a way to come out of the gate and has to, 
obviously your confidence has to be extremely high at that juncture. Yeah, I felt like I was, this was going to be easier than it was <laughs> uh, or than it has been. Um, you know, I came out and I just felt like I won on the Canadian tour. I won on the web.com tour. I was just uh, like this progression was going to be smooth and easy and I was just going to get out and have success right away. Um, but uh, as everybody knows, this game's pretty humbling. It can bring you down a little bit uh, pretty quickly. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of battles. I've had a lot of successes. But, man, it's been a fun uh, fun ride playing professional golf for a living. And then you make it to the PGA Tour in 2009. Um, yeah. It has to be a dream come true. But what's that first year like? I mean, I've talked to a bunch of guys, you know, and you're kind of behind the eight ball as the new guy out there because these guys have all played the golf courses 15 times. How, how is that first year of trying to transition – to the PGA Tour off the web, what, what maybe surprised you the most or is the most difficult part about that transition? Um, gosh, it's hard. It's, uh, for me, the difficult part um, for me was just kind of battling this um, sense of like actually belonging out there. I've been a golf fan my whole life or since I was 11, 12, 13 or whatever. And, you know, I, I get to that first tournament. My last name's Tomasulo. My locker's next to David Toms, and I was excited about meeting David Toms. I'm meet Jim Furyk or what? All these guys, the VJ Singh's out there, Tiger Woods is out there, Phil Mickelson's out there, and you're like, I'm excited to meet these guys. I, I didn't feel like I was, I don't know, maybe I was too excited and not ready enough to go. Okay, I'm here to beat these guys, not to be a fan, and. I didn't feel like a real sense of belonging out there. And so I got off to kind of a rough start. I missed a couple, uh, a couple cuts early and I just felt like, uh, yes, you do feel behind the eight ball cause you don't know what to expect. You don't know what the experiences are like and you feel like you're competing against guys that are really good. And I, I, I lost a lot of confidence really quickly that I could compete at that level. And I should have had a lot of confidence. I had just played really well and proved myself the last few years and I should have had a lot of confidence, but I lost it really quickly. And I was really surprised at how, how much of a battle that was. I was expecting it to be the absolute best year of my life. I was going to make a ton of money. It was going to be a great experience. I was going to hopefully contend to some tournaments that I've watched on TV my whole life. And it, it didn't go as well as I thought. And I, and I got beat up pretty quickly. So, um, I think a lot of people don't really realize how how quickly that happens to so many people. Oh, I, I totally, I mean, from doing 35 episodes of this podcast, most of the, you know, the Jordan Spieths of the world, the Phil Mickelsons of the world, their ascension to the PGA Tour and winning and staying out there. That's that's the the oddity. Most no, it's, guys. It's so rare. Oh. And, and, and people, go, people go, man, you know, you, you could just punt like Jordan Spieth does. Like you could just, you know, you can move up there so fast and you go, well, no one does. It's, it's, it's hard. It's not that easy to do. Yeah, um, I had Tom Pernice on, right? And he didn't play his best golf out there. He went out there, didn't make it, I think, twice, and then played his best yeah. golf from 40 to 52. He was exempt and won twice, right? It, yeah. That grind that, I mean, it, it, now you think of Tom Pernice as kind of like a household name. He's been doing it ever, but when I was kind of doing the background for the podcast, the amount of grinding and dedication and perseverance, you know, how do you not respect a guy like that? But it did not happen overnight, even though he's kind of like in the golf arena, he's a household name. But it took yeah. 20 years for him to be a household name. It and is, he plays uh, his golf in his 40s, but it's that pathway of getting out there, not making it, getting better, coming back stronger, happens from my research I've done, you know, way more common than, you know, uh, when I had Kelk on, and he's just so good out of college, he gets his card at 20 and never looks back for 30 years. That's that's the odd. It's rare. There's it's been rare. Very, few, there's very few guys that do it. The majority of professional golfers, even the, I'd say the majority of guys out on the PGA Tour have battled quite a bit, you know? No doubt. I look at a lot of them, those names up there. It's, it's, it's not as easy a path as, um, I don't know. I don't know if many people think it's an easy path, but it is a very difficult path to get out to get out and, uh, and maintain uh, that level of play, you know, you have to be, you know, the PGA Tour is the best tour in the world. You basically have to be a top 125 golfer in the world to keep your card. That's a hard thing to do. No, I think real golf fans understand it, and I think that's why, yeah. you know, they respect the guys on the Canadian tours and Latin American tours, and, you know, those guys can still really play. It's a very fine line, 
And it, <laughs> it's, I don't think that people realize the hard work and the grinding that it takes to to even get at the web.com level, let alone PJ Tour. It's There's a lot of perseverance. And, and what you guys do, I think a lot of people respect it because of the amount of time, effort, perseverance it takes to get there. It's, like I said, the, the five guys I could pull out of the air, you know, they're not the norm. The norm is no. the upward grind of it. It's it's There's a, always an interesting backstory to most of the people. Like I said, I'm talking to Pernice. It was fascinating how he, you yeah. know, and he plays best golf. In his 40s, late 40s, he was playing some of the best golf. So it's that's the cool part about the game, too, that, you know, you can still play some really damn good golf at 45, 46, 47, and still really compete out there. So it, it oh. makes for an interesting story. Yeah, I mean, you got guys, you guys got guys out here that are forty-five, and you got guys that are nineteen and twenty-one, and <laughs> still competing all right? up together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. From that first year to being, from that first. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. From the first year being out there, is there any good Phil Tiger VJ stories that you got to play with them, or something like that? That was just kind of a. I mean, I know you're you're their peers at that point, but it was still kind of a cool story of, you know what we no. would consider a, a mainstream of the PJ tour playing with a young guy who just got his card. No, I didn't. Um, I didn't, ha- I played so poorly. I didn't really get, you know, you're not paired with them on Thursday or Friday and I didn't play well enough to ever get in a position to uh, play with them on the weekend. Um, so I don't unfortunately have any, uh, cool stories from that first year of like being out there and getting to, getting to cut it up with them. Um, my, my first memory of playing a tournament that Tiger was in was at Torrey Pines. And I just, I just remember going there and I'm saying, look, it was early in the season, but I had had a couple instances early on where I, I got intimidated by the situation. I feel like, and I said, look, you're here to compete against these guys. You're not a fan. You're, you're here to beat these guys. Let's go out there and try to do it. And I'm not going to care who's near me. I'm doing my business. And so I got out there on Torrey Pines and I'm sitting down on the putting green and I'm working on my, drills that I do and all of a sudden it's just sea of people come you can just feel it when Tiger's around and like this sea of people come I look behind me and Tiger's putting at the hole behind me and I just like kind of backed up and I was sitting there for a second and I just caught myself I was just staring at him like and I looked around and everybody on the putting green whether uh, whether they were PGA Tour veteran or a rookie everybody was staring at him he just got this like aura about him that when as soon as he walks out and maybe it's the thousand people that just showed up on the putting green but it's just it's a crazy feeling i caught myself just staring at him like okay all right regroup <laughs> you're just you, you gotta get into your zone and keep right. practicing but it's the, it's the fan part of you this guy's a this guy's just an absolute legend he's the best of all time and um you're a fan still you know but like i said that you kind of convince you not convince yourself you've earned your way out there you can compete yeah. against him and you, <laughs> yeah. you know there's no there's no reason you can't you know you have the skill set and you're there. Yeah, but it's just funny the the feeling of that. And I looked around the putting green; everybody's looking at him. It's just uh, he's a different uh, different breed, it's a different animal, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just no pun intended with the tiger thing. But no, I mean, even yeah. when I've been on tournaments and you see him. It's just yeah, there's an aura, right? There's a yeah. there's an aura of winning that many times. What seventy nine and fourteen majors will do, right? I mean, yeah. he's got that it thing. That's for sure. That eightieth is coming soon. I have a feeling too. Yeah, he's he's trending the right way. You can tell the only thing that's going to be interesting on sidebar on that is can he put four together? It seems like yeah, he, he always will. has having this one round now that used to be a sixty eight that turns into a seventy two. But he's I like his golf swing right now. It looks more natural, yeah. less forced. I I wouldn't be surprised if he winds up with a win by the end of the year. Personally, I think I wouldn't he's, be, I'd be. I'd actually be surprised if he didn't. I think he. I mean, I wouldn't wouldn't ever bet against that guy. No, no, it's far as competitors go and you know, like you don't forget how to win right i mean once he's yeah. done it that many times if he's in the hunt that that memory doesn't go away yeah. um but speaking of winning again so you go back on the web and then in 2010 you win the wayne gretzky classic that has to be a huge confidence boost after a tough year on the pga tour absolutely um i think when i think back on what i've done that's my favorite memory in golf um just because I went through this battle of being on the PGA tour and going, having so much struggle, I was so down in my game. And I was just, I just, it's crazy to think like I went out on the PGA tour and just got beat up emotionally, like more, like I just, I had no confidence and I, was, I had to go back to the web and I just, 
I wasn't happy about it, you know? And then as I got the year going, I started playing a lot better. And, uh, that's actually a tournament that my bro- I was telling, I was talking about my brother earlier. He came out to caddy for me for that tournament. And, um, we just had a blast the whole week. And, um, I shot 61 in the last round. I birdied my last three holes to win by one over Keegan Bradley and Kevin Chapel. Um, and it was just, it was so exciting, so fun. Um, it was a great course, great location. It was just uh, probably my best memory in golf. It was really fun. And to go that low on a Sunday when you needed it, right? Like, how cool is yeah. that? Like, that's what everyone dreams of. Like, comes down the last four or five holes, and can you do it or can't you in doing it? Especially beating, like, what those two guys have done in their career. I mean, it yeah. still has to be a great feeling to know that you can do it if need be. Yeah, that was, uh, like I said, Kevin had a, had a, like a six or seven shot, maybe a six shot lead or five shot lead or something like that. And, uh, I just, I was just coming down the stretch and I just, I knew I'd made a lot of birdies. And I looked at the board and I was close and it was just, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a great, great memory. I hit a seven iron in close on 16. I hit a four iron in close on, uh, 17, hit a wedge close on the last. It's just, um, man, it was a great memory. When did your injury start to creep into your golf game? Was that around 2010, 2011, was, or when did you start fighting that a little bit? It was actually at the end of that that year. Um, I uh, so that that tournament was in July, and um, in September, I think it was. There were five tournaments left on the season. I was 11th on the money list, and I we played a pickup basketball game in Chattanooga on a Tuesday night. Um, and I broke my foot playing basketball. And so I had a, a stress or I had a fracture in my fifth metatarsal, which is like outside of your, my right foot. And so I was out for the rest of the season. And I was almost ended up missing, uh, missing getting my PGA tour card there. Cause I dropped so much in the last five tournaments of the season. Um, but I've had, uh, I've had to miss two or three tournaments every year, uh, since then, um, do the injury except for this year this is actually the best i've ever felt since 2010 seems like such a long time ago um or it was i guess and um so i feel good now but i've had i've had uh, i've had some battles what other injuries have you had to deal with that you know besides a broken bone that sort of affected your game and then how do they creep into maybe some bad swing uh, habits etc cetera, etc cetera? what else have you kind of fought down that pathway so i was actually just telling this story i don't know um uh, to Max on the way up because he didn't uh, he didn't know about the story. But that uh, at the end of that season, I played. Uh, I, we were coming down to the Tour Championship, and I had dropped from 11th to 18th on the money list. And the Tour Championship, I had to play because um, I could fall out of the money list, and uh, I could lose, not get my PGA Tour card. And but I was in a boot. And so I, I called the tour and I asked if I could use a cart for 72 holes because you have to finish 72 holes for the money to be official. And they said, no, I couldn't. That's, you know, intentionally breaking the rules for 72 holes is <laughs> illegal. You can't do that. And so I showed up there in a walking boot and um, was planning on playing. And the Titleist guys, the FootJoy guys, um, got me a, a, a sandal as opposed to actual golf shoes. So I taped up my taped up my foot like crazy before every round they had a great physical therapist there helping us out i taped up my foot had a walking sandal and walked with a cane for 72 holes <laughs> and played shoot? uh i actually i was blown away i shot 72 the first round and was like kind of middle of the pack uh and then uh i woke up the next day in more pain than i ever have been in my life like i just i, I just walked with a cane for 72 holes on a broken foot and I shot 80 the next day. I finished, uh, I finished 59th in the tournament because Chris Kirk didn't play the tournament. <laughs> he uh, he uh, didn't play the tournament. It was a 60-man field. But I had to do that to make my money in order to, do, uh, in order to play. Um, and so that injury ended up, I guess my point of the story was that injury ended up progressing uh, or taking longer to heal than, uh, than it should have because I walked a 72-hole golf tournament with a broken foot. That that's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Yeah. But I get why you had to do it, right? I mean, what are you going to do? Not, you know, I, I do it again. Would I, give, right? Yeah, I, you have to. I do it again. I, I ended up dropping because it's a it's a big money purse last year. I ended up dropping from 18th to 23rd 
on the money list. And so I had to protect my chance to, you know, I had to get that guaranteed money so that I wouldn't fall to 26. If I move, move to 26, I'm back on the web. Right. right. Um, and I, and so I had to do it. It's kind of a crazy experience uh, to look back on, but I, I do it again. Unfortunately, I think it caused some issues with my body. Um, the next year I got a, a torn intercostal in my, in my rib and had a stress fracture um, and had to miss like four months. Um, and then as soon as I came back, uh, the next year, I, um, I had a bunch of hip pain in, at the farmer's insurance open in, uh, San Diego and I had a torn labrum in my hip. So then I had to go to surgery and miss six months, uh, with a hip surgery. Um, and then I've just had some, uh, some neck issues, uh, a hernia surgery, uh, uh, shoulder. I've got another torn labrum in my right hip. Uh, I've had a bunch of I've had a bunch of stuff uh, that's gone on, but I feel really good now. And um, I don't know. I just I just need to get my get my game in shape because uh, my body feels really good now. And they say golfers aren't tough, huh? Holy cow, man! That's that's impressive to walk with a broken foot for seventy two holes. To I mean, <laughs> I mean, you said you have to do it. That's a crazy story. You could have too bad you couldn't have hired like Sherpas or something like that to carry you from from hole to hole. But I'm sure the tour wouldn't have allowed that one either. But yeah, you you have to physically walk it, right? There, I mean, it's that or you're DQ'd. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and I, I think if you hop in a cart, um, you get a two shot penalty, but you can't intentionally right. do that over and over again I think, you know you can't intentionally just break the rule break the rules for 72 holes i, I would have shot 160 because i'd have a two-shot penalty every hole but uh, i would have finished the tournament still so, right you got a great story of getting a card like i don't know if there's anyone better than that of <laughs> having a given on a broken foot to get on the pga tour like i mean yeah, I, literally, that one I literally used a, used a cane i was going to use a golf club my caddy said You've got to get a legitimate cane. So we went to a medical <laughs> supply store on Wednesday <laughs> afternoon and got a cane. And I, I was l- planning on playing in an Aircast uh, boot and walking in that. And, uh, yeah, I just ended up using a, uh, a golf sandal with spikes on it. Can, um, you, can you imagine the crazy. average fan who's just like out there to drink some beers, having a good time, and this, this is the best 60 players out there? And this like, guy looks fit. He looks young. What the hell is he doing? <laughs> Doing out there with a cane, people must know, have been like, "What the hell is going on?" There wasn't like you know like the social media presence there is now. So like I, I think literally no one at the tournament that was watching knew what was going on. They just you know they're out there watching golf and some guy cruises by with a cane and a sand, one golf shoe and one sandal. <laughs> they probably they have no idea what's going on. I was swinging with like with my right heel up in the ground and just my toe touching the ground because it. I couldn't turn around my broken foot. So I was just barely putting my right foot on the ground and just leaning on my left side and um, <laughs> trying to just trying to just finish 72 holes from out. Twitter would have blown up on that one. Like you would have had the biggest following ever just to see like the tracker of what Thomas Sula would have shot with a cane and a I cast, know. right? Like that would have been like the best free media ever for getting your name out there. Hell, I would have watched yeah. each round progressively of how it was going on. That's a great story anyway. though, man. Yeah, it, actually, I remember now. I actually, I beat one guy, and I, I beat Steve Pate. He was 49 years old, and he was heading to the Champions Tour. And after the tournament, I handed him the cane, and I told him to take it to the Champions Tour. <laughs> I bet you the Volcano I just loved that, that one, huh? Yeah, oh, my he, God. Can you imagine getting ready to go out there, and you get beat by a guy with a broken <laughs> foot, and he gives you the cane? Well, welcome to the Champions Tour, old yeah. man. Oh, my God, that's even better. I do remember people, doing that. Of all people, Pete, right, who also is like a character and a half in the game of golf, right? People love him as well. Another guy that we were talking about earlier, you know, the the guy, he's got a temper. He's a really fierce competitor. He's got a temper. But what a cool, cool guy he is. And like I said about Spencer, everybody loves him. I don't know anybody that doesn't like that guy. I agree with you. I think he's like yeah. the same vibe as Spencer. Like people yeah. love the volcano because we've all want, but like off the course, I know people who know him. I don't know him personally, but I've heard like he's the greatest dude ever. Like oh, people love him. The, the first PGA Tour event I ever played in was at Pebble Beach. And um, on Sunday, I got paired with him. And he was, and he was cool as can be, but he just lost it on the second tee. Um, 
and there's you know there's a big gallery around. Uh, I, I don't know if you've been to Pebble where it just yeah I played it. It kind of yeah. it, it kind of it kind of bottlenecks right around that second tee there, and uh, man, he just lost it with some some old people in the gallery. <laughs> I was just laughing, thinking, man, eh, this is what the I vol- heard about him. The yeah, volcano the has volcano. been lit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, like I said, people, people. I'll, man, I'll speak for myself. I, you know, robots aren't as fun to watch as people who like wear it on their sleeve sometimes, right? Like that's yeah. what's enduring about those guys. But yeah. that's a great story though of handed Pete the cane. That is that yeah, is freaking yeah. awesome. <laughs> Get ready for the champ gets that's not a good confidence builder for the volcano to go on the champions tour. Hey Steve, how'd your week go? DFL, I, I got beat by a kid with a cast and a cane and he handed it to me. Like that's not <laughs> How I probably would want to transition that in on the other side, but it's great. He's story. got thick enough skin and a good enough career that he could handle handle yeah, a little exactly. ribbing by me. Exactly, and then um, another victory, 2012. You're at it again, and and my question is on the winning. Does it get easier as you've done it more often? Like by the time you won in, in 012, the, does the feeling come back like I've done this before? I know what my body does when I get in contention. I know what the adrenaline's going to do. I'm comfortable in this situation. Does does winning breed winning? I, I think it absolutely does. Um, I think like you know when you have an experience where you where you come down the stretch and everybody that you're playing with, everybody that's in contention is nervous, excited. The pressure feels like it's on you, and you do better than everybody else. That it can't help but give you confidence. Um, there's no way it can't really, and. Um, you know, I think that's why you see when when a guy like breaks through and wins, you see him have a lot of success after that. Um, just because that just it just can't help but breed confidence when you do that. And so, yeah, that one um, that was a great tournament at a great course, um, Victoria National up in Evansville, Indiana. Um, really hard golf course. Um, that was a uh, that was a really fun, really fun win. The other question I have is kind of like looking at 15 years of playing professional golf. And in your 15 years of being a pro, how has the game of golf changed in your opinion? Have you had to make changes in your game as the equipment has changed? And, and do you like the direction of where professional golf is sort of going at this level? And the reason I ask this is that argument of it was more fun when the ball would spin more. And you kind of got out on tour right when that equipment, i.e. the Pro V1, was changing where the ball didn't spin as much. But, uh, you know, it's still, it's even say the 10 years, there's definitely a case where more power seems to be kind of winning that battle. What's just sort of your take on the 15 years you've been out there and, and which direction it's going and how is it, have you had to make changes in your game with it? Yeah, so, 15, gosh, it's crazy, it's been 15 years. But yeah, when I came out, I was, um, in terms of the direction the game's going, I was one of the longer guys out and one of the younger guys. So I was, when I was 23, I got I got on the Web.com tour, and there were probably less than 10 guys that were under 25 at that time that were on the Web.com tour. The, the, the game was just a lot older than at least at this level. Um, there weren't a lot of young guys that came right out of college and onto the PGA tour. I think there was no one in my class that did, and Bill Haas and Camilo Villegas were the uh, got out after one year of playing the Web.com, and now the tour is so much younger. I mean, I think there's less than 20 guys that are over 35 now. And the majority are 27 and under out here. Um, and I, that, that's a huge way it's changed. I think that's great. I think it's healthy. I think it makes golf way more exciting and fun to watch when the guys are younger. Uh, I'm an older guy and I can admit that it's more fun to watch when these guys are younger and it's more exciting. And then also that when I was young, and I was 23, 24 years old, I was one of the longer guys on the web.com tour at that time. And then uh, at this point, I'm actually longer than I was then. I'm longer right now at 36 years old than I was at 23, 24 years old, but I'm in the bottom half of length out here on the web.com tour. So the game is to progress to guys that are younger, more athletic, and hitting it a heck of a lot farther than they were back then. And um, I think, that personally, I think it's great for the game. I think it's the evolution of the sport. Guys are getting more athletic. There's more technology to learn how to hit the ball farther and how to hit the ball more consistently further. 
And I think that's great for the game. And um, I, th- I don't think the technology needs to be rolled back. I don't. I, I, I just think all this stuff that's going on with golf is good for the game. When I was out there, you know, I'm six foot tall, 185 pounds. I'm not short, not huge. Some of these young kids, they look like lumberjacks. I mean, six foot five, six foot four. Each one of their shoulders is like both of mine put together. You know, and I'm watching these guys hit these utility irons off the tee with rollout, 280, 290 yards, 275 yeah. all day. It's crazy to watch the speed in which, in the size of some of these younger guys, they, you know, you. It looks like they could have played linebacker at, at D1 college, let alone golf. It's That's the part I know is that's changing. Yeah, but the thing that's cool about golf is that if that guy's hitting it crooked, some guy that's my size that hits it even shorter than I do can beat him if he's got a good short game and he hits it straight and he keeps it in play and keeps it below the hole. and has the, like it, the, the, the difficult part about hitting it that far is that it's, harder to control it's harder to control your distances on wedges and so you, you've got to in order to be great at golf you've got to control all aspects of your game it's great to be able to hit it far but it makes certain aspects of the game a lot harder it's a lot easier for zach johnson to hit a wedge close than it is for someone that hits it so far and dustin johnson has proved that like once he gets his wedge game dialed in he's the best player in the world or brooks kepka and you've got to control all aspects of your game or you're just not going to be able to beat everybody. And, yeah, um, right. Then Brian Gay can still be competitive, right? Hitting exactly. 285 or Zach Blair last week. Right. I mean, those guys That's can wedge it and just... short iron it. That's what makes it interesting. But I've noticed a lot of these, a the, lot of the younger guys, not all of them, but there's a lot of them that were, I would say bigger than I'm 45 years old than the previous kind of generations. If that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think, I think that's kind of, I think you're seeing the kind of tiger effect, final like really coming into coming into play where guys that are just more athletic guys are in, interested in golf and playing golf at a young age um made the spot the sport a lot cooler and a little less stuffy i guess and and so these guys grow up liking golf being fans of golf and they're big athletic guys and if these big strong athletic guys that hit it a mile can control their short irons they're going to be amazing at golf and that's what you're seeing there's your Dustin yeah. Johnson scenario, right? Yeah. Don't play, exactly. go away from the hook, play the fade. And if you can play from 125 yeah. or 150 and in and put it well, then it's a deadly combo. Yeah. Um, last questions I have, they're just sort of rapid fire, whatever kind of comes to your mind. So we'll okay. finish up with this and um, I think I've got some good ones here. So guys on the PGA tour or web.com tour, or even champions tour, doesn't matter. Dream for some, you're going to pick three other golfers. You're going to go out and play a money game, dinner and drinks at night. Who you bring in, and what do you like most about these three guys? Okay, um, well, two of my my closest friends from Long Beach, um, John Mallinger and John Merrick, would be um, uh, my first two picks for sure. Um, they're two of my closest friends, um, and they're fun to go out and have drinks with both of them. Uh, and then for the third, oh man, that's a tough call. Um, Colt Colt knows he always brings a good time. Yeah, I, I had him on the podcast. He seems like a great dude. Like you could totally oh, hang with yeah. him. And he is uh, he is fun, and uh, he's fun to gamble with too. That guy really likes to gamble, and um, there's probably not many more people I would enjoy taking money off more than him. But um, I also stings to give it to him, so it's uh, that would make for a fun group. Well, this kind of falls into my next one. Did you do you like to play, or is there any good stories I should say on Tuesday games or anything like that with other touring pros for cash? And has there ever been a great story or one that stands out that got kind of crazy, um, maybe on the betting or the outcome of it? Uh, no, I can't think of any right off the bat that really stand out. But uh, I like to play on Tuesdays. Sometimes the practice rounds, especially if you've seen the course a lot, can get a little monotonous. So guys like to play money games. Like we got to we're going to have a money game tomorrow out there at this, uh, at the practice round for this web.com event with the guys in the house. And, um, yeah, I don't have, I don't, unfortunately I don't have any great stories about the uh, crazy money exchange in hand, but we always like to gamble on anything. It could be, you know, we're going to gamble on the soccer game this afternoon or the baseball game. Golfers love to gamble. Our whole life is a gamble. We're trying to, uh, uh, play golf for a living. So it's, um, most of the guys like to gamble. Best golf shot you ever hit under pressure? 
um, at the um, Victorian National um, Golf Tournament 2012, the United Leasing Championship, I hit a uh, I hit a nine iron um, close on the last hole to force a playoff. I hit one to about ten feet um, on a really tough hole location by water. Um, that's probably the best shot I've hit under pressure. Most interesting people you've ever gotten to meet, not necessarily golfers, but because of you being a professional and of you know in the game of golf. Um, so do you, two or three people that stand out that you got to meet them because of what you do for a living? Uh, I'd say Aaron Rodgers and Charles Barkley would be um, the two biggest names and uh, just awesome people to get to know, to meet, uh, to stay in touch with. It's just those two guys, hands down, coolest, most interesting people that I've uh, gotten to know. At your home golf club, do you keep a handicap? And if so, what is your handicap? I don't, but um, we usually play the plus five. So if a guy, uh, you know, one of the guys that I play with at home the most, he's a two handicap, and I give him. Oh, now that I think about it, I, I'm getting I'm getting away with this. I give him three shots aside, um, so I should give him one more, I guess. But we won't tell him about that. Nah, I think plus five is a yeah. Plus I think you four. Guys are normally, you're yeah. I think you guys are normally guys around plus, plus six, plus right? Plus five. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, somewhere in there. We, we're negotiators. Like I said, we like to gamble. So we want, <laughs> you want to be on the right side. We try to negotiate as well as we can. Yeah, I, I don't like that bet against the two if I'm the two, <laughs> right? I think you're going to have to give me a few more here, Pro, because I'm not quite buying the plus four here. Plus six seems more on the up this and is up. The way but, hey, if, if he's going to give it to you. He goes. That's the way every yeah. first he goes. you gotta, you got to uh, assess your ego versus trying to win the bet. So, I am uh, about to bet with no ego, so I would be demanding uh, more. You, you guys are too good. Me, me too. It's negotiation. Best three or four golf courses in the world architecturally. This is the last one here. And, and, and what makes those courses so great in your opinion? Pebble Beach, um, for me, number one, hands down. Um, just everything about it. I think the I think the design of the course is actually underrated. Like a lot of people don't like it. I don't know why they. It seems absurd to me that someone could not like that place. Um, I think that's, and then the views and everything, that's hands down to me the best course I've ever played. Um, and then the other ones, actually Max and I just played Muirfield Village on the way up from uh, Springfield to uh, New York. And that would just jumped into the top five for me. I'd say Riviera um, and Robert Trent Jones Golf Course in Virginia. Those would be... Uh, um, my favorites. I, I, I love um, all those courses have par fives that, or drivable par fours that make exciting holes and scorable holes. And then they also have really, really tough holes. I think a good design golf course has all that. I like a short par four on a good golf course. I like par fives that have some risk and reward and are you have a chance to make a three, but you could also make some trouble. And then some really tough par fours where you have to hit two solid good shots to have a birdie putt. Um, that, that that sums I, up Pebble Beach, doesn't it? I mean, it kind yeah, of does. Yeah, and I think. Well, I think every one of those courses. I, and then I'd also put Quail Hollow in there. I think those those are my top five that I have played, and all those courses have have all that. Um, the, the the best one on the Web dot com tour is Victoria National in Evansville, Indiana, and that for sure has all those exciting, tough par fours some short par some short par fours and then also uh, some reachable with trouble par fives do you like pebble more than cypress point i do i do yeah I'm, I'm, I'm with you on I'm, that I'm, i like I'm, the golf I'm, course I'm more stubborn on that i like arguing it too <laughs> yeah cypress has just some of the like you know you know, like 15 is a cool little par three. I think overall yeah. golf course, I enjoy playing Pebble March. More Cypress has some of the coolest holes you've ever seen. I mean, I'm lucky I played it once. But if I had to like pick to play each course every day, I would take Pebble. If someone yeah, said, here's your, go, here's your country club, go play it. I, I love Pebble. I don't mean that in a demeaning fact to, or a demeaning manner to Cypress Point by any means. It's an amazing, amazing golf course. But it's just, I feel that strongly that Pebble is my favorite place that I've ever played golf. And the the feeling you get on Cyprus, I don't know if there's a feeling like that on any other course I play. They feel like you're not supposed to be out there when you're out there. Like like that you snuck out there or something. Because you just feel it feels special. And it feels pretty exclusive, you know, very yeah, exclusive out there. 
But it's as good as but, it gets uh, from that standpoint. But, but Pebble's just uh, nothing like it. Well, I can't thank you enough for the conversation. I've I've truly enjoyed it. Best of luck this week and the rest of the year on the web. And then uh, when you get back to the PGA Tour, because it will happen, um, hopefully we can talk to you again when you get your first victory out there, and uh, it'd be a great recap conversation of uh, that journey you're sort of on. So best of luck with everything. I would love that. Thanks for having me, Jason. Uh, had a good time.